Um, I'm Betsy Fisher Martin, and I am the executive director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University. But more importantly, I'm a New Orleans girl, grew up here, and am now a part time resident. So happy to be with you all today. So we have a great panel, as you can see here, of this dynamic powerhouse women panel to talk to you all about women in politics and uh, leadership. And I thought what we would do was go down the line. I have like an initial question for each of you, and I'll read a little bit of your, your bio along the way and talk about your books. But when we had this conversation the other day, we did a kind of planning call, and I wish we would have recorded it for y'all, because <laughs> a lot of good stuff there. But Donna had a, a great point, and she said, the glass ceiling is cracking, but who will rise? And how do we sweep up the glass so it's open to everybody? And so that's kind of like how I want to frame this discussion. Uh, I will save plenty of time for your questions, and I know we have a mic up here for that. So please be thinking of your questions. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to just start with Mary here. Most of you, of course, know Mary Madeline, but I first got to know Mary back in 1992 when she was working on the reelection campaign of H.W. Bush. Then, of course, you know, she went on to work in the W. Bush White House as a top advisor to the president and the vice president. Um, and she's written several books and co-written with her husband, James Carville, of course. Uh, her books, the first one, which I still love, and I still have students read this, this book in my class, uh, All's Fair, Love, War, and Running for President, which they co-wrote in 1993, uh, after that 92 campaign. And then, of course, 20 years later came Love, War, 20 Years, Three Presidents, Two Daughters, and Lone Louisiana Home, <laughs> which is also a terrific book. And she also wrote a book, uh, Letters to My Daughters, as well. So I guess, Mary, I want to start with you because of your long career in politics, even going way back to the 80s when you first started in politics and you've seen so much, what is your perspective on women in politics, the experiences that you've had and what shaped you as, as a, a woman in politics? Well, before we get to that, let's uh, hats off to Betsy Fisher who is a true, a true <laughs> leader and is, is epitomized a leadership with women, and I'm reminded of what she wrote. Told it. She had, the, when we met, she, she uh, were you executive producer for Tim Russert, who said, and I'm gonna say this because he's not here about my husband, right. if Mary Madeline took her SUV and ran over her husband three times in full view of her entire neighborhood, she'd be acquitted by a jury of her peers. <laughs> <laughs> that, so uh, J Betsy was the one that kept me well, we had a lot of good times. <laughs> so this is, can I, all of us like our New Orleans, this is amazing. amazing. Hats off to Cheryl and to Walter and to Tulane. Like the, the, this is just. <laughs> was anybody at the last one? The one pre, okay, it was kids and you know, it was, this is amazing, which is a tribute to so many things, not least. New Orleans, yeah. so uh, it's just so cool to be back and with the community again, and to be on this panel, uh, most of whom I know, some of whom I've just met, but it's really was, this call really was inspiring, and it changed what I was going to talk about, uh, pivoting off of Donna's framing question, who makes it through the glass ceiling? And the other uh, really innovative and progressive things, and I have small p progressive, I'm not doing politics, uh, that the other ladies have said. And this is my one giant 50 years in politics. Yes, I start, um, this is true. My first political act wow. was in 1970. I marched in the first Earth Day award, uh, first Earth Day parade or march. In, in a, back in the old environmentalist days. So that was literally 50 years ago. Time, it's just amazing. So what, what inspired me on this call is the things that we were talking about that remain obstacles to women breaking through the glass ceiling or elevating through the glass ceiling, so much has changed in those 50 years, but the essential guiding principles 
remain the same. And my big takeaway from 50 years in business or politics or life or marriage or mothering is uh, all pivots off of this uh, ostensibly uh, ridiculously uh, st statement that sounds so like obvious, which is, uh, well, I, I like obvious statements. They once asked Reed Charles, what's the worst thing about being blind? He said, you can't see. So this worst, this, this obvious thing is, change is certain, progress is not. So everybody says that it's very cliche, but what does that actually mean? What does it mean for people of all genders and whatever your station in life is, who's gonna break through to the next level? He or she or they who can manage change. And that sounds like it's an easy thing. It's a horrible thing because people don't like to deal with change. They're afraid of change. You can see this reflected in the polls. You can see it reflected in voters' behaviors. You can see it globally. And in this, these turbulent times, and for this generation in particular, to acknowledge the presence of change and to learn how to deal with it is those are the people that are going to make it to the next level. So the, the second big takeaway I had is always choose with circumspection your mentors. And my two mentors way back when said essentially the same thing or two sides of the same coin. The first said you become the way you behave and the other said create your own reality. So the way you manage change is by aligning your behaviors with your objectives. A, aligning your behaviors with your objectives, and B, understanding that you're, be, you're if you're not motivated to do a behavior, understand the relationship between behavior, or between motivation and ability. If you're highly motivated to do something, if it's politics, or it's the TV show, or it's being Donna's friend, <laughs> if you're highly motivated, then you can do really hard things, it, and it, or you can do easy things. If you don't have a lot of motivation and you have to do something, which is often the case for women or in business or in academia, if you have to do something and you're low motivation, and this is how management changes, you do the best, uh, do a teeny tiny little thing. I know this sounds stupid, but it really works and there's lots of tiny things give you why you're in this feeling of success. And a succession of successes wires in a confidence that, um, I don't want, and I'm not maligning either gender, but women tend to not act until they feel really confident about something. They wait for like this big moment, like in the White House mm -hmm. meeting or whatever, and you wait till you're prepared to wow everybody. That's not, if you take incremental steps and teeny tiny things and you keep building your confidence, this, the point of all this is there are models that work. I wish somebody had told me that 50 years ago. I thought you just had to go figure it out. There are literally models, and, and I'm not just talking about self-help books, and of course there's mentors and there's support groups and all that stuff, but there are analytical Stanford models of how you can affect change in yourself. At first you have to put on your mask, all women have to do that, put your own mask on first, take care of yourself first, and how you can be a change agent simply by managing motivation and ability and aligning it with the triggers or the prompts or the objective. So that's my big, the, and so one corollary to that is how you think about, if you can't change your reality, you have to change your perception of that reality. That works in relationships a lot. But how, what you prioritize in your 20s is different from 30s and 40s and 50s. So you're always dealing with a different kind of change, a different kind of priority. So you're constantly having to manage change. Right. And uh, it, 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 so, it sounds so easy, but it is just this morning in, t in the Washington Post, there was a story that the White House yesterday, you probably initiated this, had Gen Z, I don't even know what alphabet we're on now, <laughs> Gen Z TikTokers in. It's like one of these TikTokers had, a, she's 18 years old, she has 10 million plus followers. I thought TikTok, you know my girls, I thought TikTok <laughs> was only for dorky mothers and cat lovers. I had no idea that. So I, I have not kept up with technical 
change, but that's a giant change in politics, in business, in, in, in academia, in everything. That did not exist for us. Don and I, when we were starting out in politics, not only were we the only women, we actually had to talk to people in person or on the phone, yeah. on a landline. Okay, there was, there was nothing. And so we were, the, the point of using the tools, the resources that change in these different epochs are part of how you can affect your change. This generation, and those of you who have actually kept up with social media, at a certain age I haven't, uh, are faster, smarter, more efficient. You're using these resources. So I, this all sounds simple, but it's, it actually is the secret sauce of getting to the next level. And there are a number of models that uh, work for me, which I'm happy to share if we, we get to that later. And there, but you can pick your own models. The point is, this is not like going through a bevy of diet books, self-help mm -hmm. books. There are literal, quantifiable models that can help you and help all of us, particularly mm -hmm. in these times where we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen in Europe. We don't know what's going to happen in China. All you can do is manage it as it comes to you. And that is my giant, universal, unifying theory of everything. <laughs> All right. That's well, great, Mary. Well, you know, thank you. Wait, thank I will, you. let me bring in Donna. And just Donna, let me just let everybody know who, um, who you are. First no, of all, Donna skip, and I. Skip, skip, skip all of that. No, no. Yeah. Skip all of that because you're going to tell my age. No, no. <laughs> and I'm still pretending that I'm 21 because I want to be of drinking age the rest of my life. All right? So I'm 21. But we are high school. I went to the same high school as Betsy. Grace King. And, and I got out earlier, uh, not because I was smarter, but I was in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 I'm going I'm to cut it short. Well, she went on, as most of you probably know, to be the first African-American woman to ever run a major presidential campaign, of course. <laughs> Al Gore. <laughs> Amazing. Then, of course, she was the interim chair of the DNC in 2016. And she wrote about that experience in her book, Hacks, which is a terrific book. And she's also written, I love this book so much, Cooking with Grease, Stirring Pots in American Politics. And then she co-wrote, most recently, another amazing book, for colored girls who have considered politics. Absolutely. So all, Thank you. All terrific books. So, Donna. She should have adopted it. Tell me. Let's say it. No, brag on your What? Team. No, I don't do that. It's been, it's got an option for a movie, that book. Nice. <laughs> woo -hoo. You knew her when. And, and I, I still want to play myself. <laughs> so, Donna, though, how do we sweep up that, the glass off the floor? Like we First talked about of all, again? it's a great honor to be back home. And some of you might know that the storm that passed through last night is in Washington, D.C. today. And it's uh -huh. actually snow and ice. And the only thing you do with snow, snow and ice is make a snowball and get a drink. All right. Uh, <laughs> It's Women's History Month. This is the month that we celebrate the achievements, the success of women who dare to make a difference. 101 years after the 19th Amendment, women have made tremendous progress, but are we there yet? No. The so-called artificial glass ceiling, it is artificial, it's a metaphor for how far we can go. The fact is, it's been cracking and we need to just start sweeping it up so that we no longer have barriers to our success. If, if the United States of America is to remain a superpower, and I'm speaking from the economy, not just the military, we must have every member of our talent pool available to work. So we have three gaps. We have to fill the leadership gap, the skill, the skill gap, and the wage gap. On the leadership front, the United States is no longer ranked number 53 out of 156 countries. We've made progress. We're number 37. <laughs> but I don't want to go to Iceland to be, you know, to have parity with men. I want to be here in America. And what will it take for us to reach parity? First of all, we have to open up more doors. We have to make sure that women have a pipeline to success. We have to not only eradicate the skills gap and the leadership gap and the wage gap, but we also the confidence gap. Sisters, if you are ready to soar, start soaring. Stop waiting for some man to tell you, come on in. And by the way, men, because I see a whole bunch of you and I don't even have on my glasses. <laughs> No woman I've ever met, and I've met a whole bunch of them, 
from Lindy Bob's. The reason why you have a credit card in your name now because of Lindy Bob's, because of Bella Abzug, you can't get fired anymore for being pregnant. Because of Eleanor Holmes Norton, when you're harassed on a job, you know, you can actually go back to work and not be harassed again, and the person who's harassing you. We have made so much progress, but we have to close that confident gap. And so why you, young women? Because no one is better. Why now? Because tomorrow's not enough. We're, never, we're not going to ask men to leave the room. We're going to ask you to scoot over and make room for others. Donna. Um, let me bring yeah. in, uh, to Donna's right, Catherine Gell, who had a very successful career in business as the CEO of Gell Foods, and now runs a, uh, the Nonpartisan Institute for Political Innovation. And she is the co-author of the book, The Politics Industry, How Political Innovation Can Break Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy. That's quite a title. <laughs> and that, you published that in 2020. And we're delighted that you could be here. Donna was talking about the pipeline. And one of the things that you put forward in the book is this somewhat complicated, but I know you can make it make sense to people, uh, final five voting, which you advocate as a way to actually level the playing field. And in effect, it would get probably more women into elected office. Tell us a little bit about that thesis of your book and, and what you're advocating for. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Betsy. And thank you to everyone. It's amazing to be here with this group of women and all of you. Um, I will tell you my book proposes this new system for how we should run our elections. It's called Final Five Voting. And I usually talk about it for two hours, so let me make it as quick <laughs> as possible. We need to make general elections the most important elections in the country. We need to stop having winners chosen in party primaries where 10% of people turn out. Because when we do that, we elect a set of people on the right and a set of people on the left who are beholden to 10% of people in their parties. And we think these sides are so unbelievably different, but they are the same in one very important way. There's something they agree on. If we elect you, don't you dare work with people from the other side. Don't you dare compromise. Don't find consensus. Don't figure out a sustainable way forward. Go for broke if it means gridlock, if it means grandstanding, if it means waiting until we take back our share and, and shove it down the other side's throat. Do it that way. Don't figure out a way to solve problems in the broad general interest. If the general election decided who wins, then people could go to Congress and work for the general electorate. And they would go there as proud Democrats and proud Republicans, but they would be incented to solve problems in the general interest. And Final Five Voting changes that whole system. It's already been adopted in Alaska. So you'll watch Alaska's results. Uh, the winner will not be chosen uh, in any primary in Alaska. It'll be chosen by a majority of general election voters. And so the key point of Final Five Voting is that it, not that it's going to change who wins necessarily, but that it will change what winners do, what they have the freedom to do, which is solve problems, what they're incented to do, again, solve problems, and what they, and on whose behalf they're doing it, a majority of general election voters. And we own these rules of election. We can change them. Alaska did it. We have other campaigns in other states for this year. So that's, that's my whole book. There is a, a piece, though, what you're asking about, Betsy, on the top of this panel is about who wins as well. So again, my purpose wasn't let's create a system where more women and other underrepresented groups will win, but it's a side benefit and a critically important one because Final Five voting changes who can compete. It lowers the barriers to entry for new competitors because in this system, there's five competitors in the general election. There's not just one Democrat and one Republican. So we will create new opportunities for more candidates to be making their case and for us to benefit from hearing from them. And that's going to create an opportunity for much better representation and, again, crucially, that once we are better represented, we will also get better results. 
and that's my system. Well, and we know women are problem solvers. So they can solve problems in the general public interest because final five voting means that, that solving problems is finally the actually the best way to get reelected. Whereas today, it's kind of the worst way to get reelected. Right. Exactly. Thank you, Catherine. Let me bring in Tanya Tetlow. Tanya is a proud Tulane alum. Uh, she is uh, the first female president, of course, of Loyola University. And very sadly for us, she's leaving uh, to become, again, the first female president of Fordham University in New York. So we're, so, we're happy for you, but we're sad you're leaving New Orleans. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. But talk about this paradigm. I mean, I, I just said two firsts for you. Talk about this paradigm of being the first and what that means for young women and for students and how that is a theme you know, across your career in many ways. Well, it's my new gig, being yeah. the first, not just first female, but first lay person. And, and that is par part of what is startling, I think, for people to adjust to, is um, that in an in institution like Loyola Fordham that is mission-driven and religious institution, that it's about who we're used to seeing exercise power, but also who is a direct line to God. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, it's dealing with both. And I will say, being the first, you don't feel like a first. I've been myself my whole life. Um, but it's, it's guessing at how people are reacting to you. And I think my st startling recognition of that was universities tend to have a hallway of, or a room with all the portraits of former presidents. And at Loyola, um, it's photographs of 16 priests. At Fordham, it, they have more money. Oil paintings of 32 priests going back to 1841. And then there's me. So, um, and then, you know, people react to that, I think. I was thinking about this preparing in, in three different ways. So most people, it signifies progress that before I do anything, that it is this fresh start, it is change, it is the future, and they get really excited about it. And it's particularly gratifying to see um, uh, female students, but also male, just be so thrilled at the possibility of this. And, and for a long time, the loudest applause I would get would be after my introduction, before I opened my mouth, <laughs> right? Because it's the, the achievement of the thing. And then you have the group of people on the other extreme who are never going to come around. And to them, it isn't about misunderstanding, and, and it isn't about something that you can persuade them of or that you should try to convince yourself that it's on you to persuade them of, because it's about power, and you're not going to be let in that door. And so you need to understand that and hope that the first group makes up for the last group, and it's not going to hurt your institution that they picked a woman. But the middle group is a fascinating one, where they're really struggling with it, but they can be persuaded of change. And I had a meeting with a, um, a donor, and I tell the story only because I know he'll never remember it, um, early on in my tenure. And I said, well, I take very seriously being the first lay president of fulfilling the Jesuit Catholic mission of Loyola. And he looked at me and he said, it's not just that. It's that you're a woman that bothers people. And <laughs> For once, you know how you think of the thing to say two months later after fuming about it forever? For once, I thought of it in the room, and it was perfect because it went right over his head. I said, well, there's not much I can do about that that you would approve of. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the postscript of that story is now we are very good friends, and that he really kind of came around with delight to the idea that this could work and that we forever change the model of what a university president looks like. To my nine-year-old daughter, they all look like me, right? That the paradigm shifts in that way. That means you're not then wasting half of the talent of humanity when you're picking people for these jobs. So that has been a thrill. And, um, and, and I think just the understanding that you, you get there, and, and I wrote a lot of law review articles, which I don't recommend you read, but the writing I do now is more speeches of how you weave in mission and history and use language in the best way to persuade, to convince people that you are part of what they value, that you're not pushing against it, but you are part of what matters most to them and you will carry it forward with new excitement. So we've, one of my, 
things that I've loved at Loyola is we had a women's leadership academy that Betsy teaches in that um, tries to really get women across all sorts of professions in New Orleans. We have a, a blithering array of engineers and doctors and business owners. And some of it's about repairing that damage that Donna talked about to our own confidence, but some of it is understanding that the th the threats to our success are also external, right? We, we often cite the research on negotiating salaries and how loath women are to negotiate their own salaries. But there's also a lot of research that when we do negotiate our salaries, we get punished for it. And I know many of you have experienced that, that when you push, there's this reaction of, why are you challenging me? with something perfectly normal like negotiating a salary. So it's, to, it's dealing with that. And then my favorite part of it is that when I started doing these administrative jobs, I, I began to read all the literature on leadership. And it ranges from real dribble to fascinating psychological insights. And what struck me is how much of it corresponded to the ways that women are socialized and to the strengths that were given, I don't think through biological imperative, but the ways we're trained and raised, which is emotional intelligence, self-awareness, um, treating people empathetically because it works, and um, communication skills. And when we talk about that uh, as women, it all becomes self-help books. When we talk about it in the leadership literature, often written by men, it becomes about how you exercise power in an effective way that actually moves the needle and makes a difference. So I think what I've loved most is to explain to women, look, we already have the tools. On average, we're actually really good at this stuff because it's what is encouraged in us when we are raised. And so how to take ownership of that and feel the confidence to get back what's been stolen from us and do the jobs and use the gifts as we're meant to do it. Yep. That's great, Tanya. <clears throat> so, Catherine, I wanted to bring you back into this point because Tanya's talking about you know, what happens when you push at something, right? And I know you have a fascinating story about you know, encouraging women and, and you putting in practice in your own life to like, actually speak up, right? Um, uh, actually take credit for the work that that's their own. Um, you know, sounds like a crazy concept, right? But women have a problem doing that. And tell us about your own experience when writing your book when it came to sharing credit with your co-author. Yeah, I could not be in a better place in the entire world to share about this topic because when I walked in this room, I realized that the last time I was in this room, I had to beg to be on this stage. So I published my book in 2020, but before that, in 2017, I published a groundbreaking report uh, on this topic out of Harvard Business School. And I had a co-author, Michael Porter, whom many of you may know, he's the father of modern, modern corporate strategy, and he is uh, the single most cited uh, scholar in, in business and economics. And, I, and he was my co-author, my second author. And after we published, this work, it got a great deal of attention. And there was a big summit on politics here, in this room, on this stage, and he was invited, even though it was my work first, and he had come in later as my co-author, and I was not invited. And then I said, hmm, I wanted the work to go forward, but I didn't want to you know, hold it back, but I asked to be included, and they said no. If she's included, you know, we don't really want to do it because we want the famous person. And uh, I said no again. I ended up in this room. It was our first major talk about this work. And we had a standing ovation. And it was the hardest thing I had ever done, which is demand that I get credit for that work that I had created instead of allowing it to be, to sort of hand the baton to someone who was more well-known and in that good position. I, I can't believe I walked into this room and, and it was here. So here's the thing. How many of you grew up this way? There's no limit to what you can get done if you don't care who gets the credit. <laughs> Lived my whole life. Uh, by the way, more women know that than men, okay? And that is true in any project you're working on in a given moment, but over time, it is absolutely not true. So imagine for a moment that you and your friend from college start a, start a tech company after uh, college and it's super successful, 
but you're the inside one, your friend's the outside one. You sell it, you're rich, both of you, you've done an amazing job. But which one of you, the inside one, or the one that's been associated with the public face, has the greater opportunity for the next startup? The one who's associated with the success, the one who got the credit. And those with credit have more power to advance ideas. Just like the rich get richer, those with credit get more credit. It is now proven. I had that experience with my co-author, and I've had it repeatedly, and it still <coughs> happens. But I push forward now because I know that unless you get that platform, you can't, in the end, make things happen. There's a man named uh, Albert Laszlo Barabashi, and he looked at big data to find out who gets credit. And what he points out is that performance is individual, but success is in the community. It's how people look at the work. And women do not ask for the credit because they're team players. Mm -hmm. Data proves that in group performance, it takes a team and they need diversity and balance to, to be effective, but only one person will be credited with this success. So because women live by, we won't ask for that credit, they don't get it, and then they don't get asked to lead the next project. Women have got to ask for credit right from the start. In my case, in Barabashi's book, he actually uh, found the data show that if you are a female economist publishing with men, the data show you might as well not bother. And I was publishing with the most cited author, a scholar in business and economics. And that and was oh, by the way, it was your you, idea. You pushed, what'd you say? <laughs> and oh, by the way, it was your idea. Yeah, the, the yeah and it was. Right. Right. And, and that's why he was the second author. And again, that's just my story yeah. to, to explain that that's what my advice to women is now is it is great. Definitely don't take credit for things for which you don't deserve credit. But don't pretend yeah. that you can advance if you don't also get credit. That's great advice. And, and we, we have a, a couple more minutes left. I want to go to some questions, but I want to do a little bit of a speed round with our other three panelists on that same topic of advice that you give young women um, along those same lines. Um, Mary? Well, young women, I... Or any women. Um, <laughs> it, it does any. sort of carry through. Going back to what I said, first put your own mask on. Women yeah. tend not to take care of themselves. And Tim's widow now just gave me this thing. said, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Mm. Actually, the, the reality is your mothers are only as happy as their least happy child. <laughs> I, I mean, it's not even funny. It's, it's just true. true. So true. you, ha but if you're no good to, if you're not controlling your change and controlling your environment internally and mm. externally, then you are not going to be able to be a, help those who are depending on you or you cannot be a, a change agent. So I say first take care of yourself, which is like, here's what they don't, this is a stupid thing, sleep hygiene. Like, do you, uh, no one, we don't sleep enough. And, I, and then I, my other advice is like, t t give your, cut yourself some slack, women tend to over, uh, admonish themselves and do give your, yourself credit and do something every day, even if it's just a tiny thing. I keep hearing this tiny things lead to big changes, uh, going from the first woman and the only one in the room to, uh, mm -hmm. in one cycle, the next, when I would then became the chief of staff of the Republican National Committee, 70% of the people sitting around the senior staff were women. That's a big change. It's a little change of being the only woman who had to wear a skirt and all that stuff. Pants were not allowed in the White House. Within one cycle, we were, were, were running the politics. So, so do not be afraid to take little things. Do not, ad, little steps. Do not admonish yourself for little steps. And do, do, do vary your brain, like stretch your brain. We're learning so much about brain, brain elasticity. So every day I try to do one creative thing, one positive thing, one physical thing, and one thing for which I'm grateful that, all of which I want to share with my sister. Even if the positive thing is something mm -hmm. like, 
The best thing that happened today is I didn't fall out of bed stepping on my arthritic ankles. Okay, that's a <laughs> positive thing. But so, I mean, it's just a stupid little thing, but it changes your, the way you self-identify, the way you self-talk. And I find that young, it, it all of this adds up to, and I keep saying there's miles and stuff, we all can give good advice, but we, we have a dearth of information on how to. So I'm listening to you saying like, I totally get what you're saying, like, but I can't, I'm hard pressing. How do you get credit? How, what is the literal way for women to say, I want credit for, for this, James, whatever, I'm just <laughs> hypothetically <laughs> saying. Name. You know. It's a throw out a name. Do you know, like, so that's my next thing. I said, yeah. find a good mentor, but also don't just get good advice. Get specific when you have a mentor. Ask literally, how do you do X, whatever you, you want to do? And I don't know that all those answers are there, but it, if you're just strategic and you're not tactical, which is the same thing in our business, all of our businesses, then you're only 50% of where you want to go. So quick advice from Donna and then Tanya, and then we're gonna take questions. Find something you love and stick with it. Good. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's hard, you're gonna have setbacks, you're gonna have people getting in your way, but if you love it, it's your passion, there's a calling. Yeah. And you know, I just wanna say something. And, I'm, and I didn't know that God is within me. Nobody's going to take that away from me. And what God has given us, no one can ever remove that. So see the power within yourself. And whenever you need a sister priest near you for some of those difficult things, call me. <laughs> <laughs> Because, hold on, this is 30 seconds, because we're in that season. When Jesus walked down, got to Calvary, the men left, they ran, the women stayed. Jesus didn't have to come back and show his wounds to the women because they were there. They saw the miracle. Now, there's something in that story that should tell something to all of you. We're going to stick around. We're going to be there when you are gone. We're going to see the miracle because, after all, that's why God gave us the assignment of giving birth. So I'll be with you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Tanya, some quick advice, and then if, if anybody wants to line up for a question. So the advantage I have, I'm from a family full of Jesuit priests, but I'm also um, raised by a mama who's a feminist theologian who's sitting right yeah. there. So she taught me all of that. Um, I, I love the kind of pragmatic advice that Mary yearned for. And one, um, the person who used to give me the most of that was Cokie Roberts. Mm -hmm. And I yes. recommend to you, her husband, Steve Roberts, wrote a beautiful book full of that advice. It's so precious. And he's actually going to speak about it Wednesday at Loyola if you want to continue your book experience. <laughs> um, but she said things to me like, you know, in, in, in agonizing over work-family conflict, it's not just about the quantity of time. It's about being really present with your children when you are home. And so things like that. But the advice I give often to younger women is to, when you have a fear, when you're filled with fear about something, first, Analyze it, is it a healthy fear? Like, I should not bungee jump. These are good fears. <laughs> but, but if it's something that's getting in the way of you doing what you want to do, like being afraid to stand on a stage like this and do public speaking, know that every time you do it, you will be a little less afraid next time. That you have to grasp the nettle and do it, and that's how you'll get through it, and that you need to, because otherwise it will stand in the way of you living out your dreams and your potential and so to do that so I think um, and that there's such joy for all of us in giving that advice to young women that they should reach out and ask for the advice and ask for mentors because actually we get really flattered when we are um, called upon to do that and so to constantly make that connection um, when I was 16 I wrote a letter to Lindy Boggs and said I want to be you when I grow up could I please meet you <laughs> and then we were friends for the rest of her life. And so to, to have the gumption to ask for those mentors. Thank Great you. advice. Thank you, Tanya. Yeah. So do we have any questions? Kathy. <laughs> There's a mic. Yeah. that men do and 
Right. Yeah, so Kathy, in case you didn't hear in the back, is asking a question about next female president and when are we going to get to the point where, for example, uh, women are not, women politicians are not being criticized for being ambitious, which is <laughs> my favorite one, right? Like, yeah. those two things go hand in hand, <laughs> right? To be a politician, you need to be ambitious. But um, anyone want to take a stab, stab at that question? First of all, I hope we also get rid of uh, likability. Yes. I mean, I mean, we we we've, we've achieved electability, but likability, and we also need to get rid of this. <laughs> well, damn it! If I'm gonna laugh, I'm gonna laugh. If you don't like the sound of my voice, well, open your mouth and let me see <laughs> what you sound like. Uh, we've removed many of the strategic barriers that women have faced, the traditional barriers that we've seen over the last 100 plus years, but still we need more women in the pipeline. I mean, nine governors in the United States of America, we, we, we have a long way to go, but I guarantee you it's coming within the next 20 years. It may come within the next two cycles, but it's coming. We will have a female president. And let me just say this, Katanji, Brown Jackson is qualified. She should be confirmed. We will finally have a Supreme Court with five men and four women. Hallelujah. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Oh, she's asking about what it's going to take to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. Well, it, it well passed, but the, there's a congressional deadline on it, so it's sort of up to the archivist of the Constitution to decide whether it's part of whether the Constitution it's expired, or not. There's yeah. some really interesting legal issues there, but I think Congress would have to come back around and reauthorize it. Who's going to do that? Well, uh, <laughs> Speaker Pelosi has already done it in the House. We know the challenges in the United States Senate, but yes, I still believe that we need a ERA introduced in 1923 by Susan B. Anthony uh, nephew. It is until we get the RA, women are going to continue to fight for fair wages. We're going to continue to fight to not being marginalized. So we need the RA, but you're right in terms of the archivists, but we're going to get the RA. Can I caveat yeah. the elephant in the room? It's not just women who are vilified. Everybody who gets into politics today is vilified. I personally can't, this is how I'm checked, uh, uh, managing my change. I'm, I've dropped out of the party and became a libertarian. Now I've just dropped out of it. <laughs> I mean, it's so ugly. It's so toxic. I'm too old. I'm, it's, you cannot expend that much emotional energy on this vilification. And it's no province of a single party or a single gender or a single race. What takes, what, what is political debate today would drive any sane person out of the system, and that is very dangerous. If you have, there's young people here, if you have young kids, they hate politics. They get all their information from TikTok, which was the point of this, I don't know, but they just <laughs> see, I, and I'm not, I like funny cats and dorky mothers and all, and I like that they get their information somewhere. They literally hate our system, even though they're, they're coming up into leadership. And that's a function of, it sounds so ugly and brutal, uh, and it really isn't like that behind the scenes, any more than like when we live in our community, it's not like it's portrayed on this. But it's driving not just women, it's driving all people of goodwill out of their civic duty, cliche, but we can all be part in affecting that change and being a change agent. What is it, Peter One? Just hold your tongue, hold your, you know, you, not everything, every thought has to be voiced and every fought, every fight has to be fought. It's just, we're just gonna have to chill, cool our jets for it to get out of this toxic business and then merit will rise to the top. Well. I see we're out of time, unfortunately. I feel like we could talk another two hours with this amazing panel. I want to thank all of you for being here. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Walter, thank you. Kathy, Cheryl, for a great, great book fest. <laughs>